Hello, thank you for joining us for Integrating Imagery to Drive Decisions. In the next 60 minutes, we'll share with you some of the imagery capabilities you might not already know about in ArcGIS. On today's webinar, we'll be covering a number of Esri imagery capabilities, and we have two industry experts who will guide us through this agenda. My name is Noelle, and I'm part of Esri's national government team, and I will be your webinar host. Our industry experts are Kurt Schwope from Esri. He'll provide an overview of these capabilities and Kyle Talbot, who will provide some demos. Before we begin, we'd like to ask all of you a question. How is imagery used within your organization? Please select one of the following on your screen. We'll give you a few seconds to answer. And we have the results in. It looks like many of you are using imagery within your organization to extract features for GIS. So thank you so much for taking the time to give us that information. And without any further delay, I will go ahead and pass this off to Kurt. Thanks, Noelle. And that was some very interesting results from those poll questions. It's exciting to see the number of uh, advanced users out there that are taking advantage of all the information that can be derived from imagery. I'd like to just, you know, start the overall presentation with a, a, a demo that we actually put together. It's a, it's a web app that was built inside of ArcGIS Online, and it was done by the Esri Disaster Response Team to support the crisis that occurred after Hurricane Maria struck the Philippines, excuse me, the Puerto Rico um, back last summer. And you can see here that we actually went into the system and we are accessing right now over 148 terabytes of imagery that was collected over the island. And you can see very high resolution aerial photography. And we can put that over our existing base map, which was taken a few years ago. And we can start doing some change analysis, some change comparison, and start looking for damaged areas that occurred as a result of the hurricane. And you can see in this particular area, it was, it was fairly devastating. A lot of houses, uh, lost roofs, certainly every roof that I could see had some degree of damage to it. Some were just completely stripped off. And what the analyst can do in this case is that by accessing all this imagery directly in a web client, uh, the imagery itself is located in the cloud and it's streamed down to this app. Um, they can actually go in and do their analysis. They can update a, a, a GIS feature layer that allows them to identify where the damage occurred. And then this gets updated and populated into this feature service, which in turn can then be accessed um, by others who are concerned about providing relief. And you'll see kind of a result of what we were able to do with this. This is an actual operations dashboard. Um, and so you could have multiple analysts out there doing the collection on the imagery, populating this, this, this feature database of damage that they've identified, but then decision makers back can go take a look at the data that was collected. They can look at the imagery, but they can also look at the points collected. And as they roam around and zoom into different areas, you can see the total amount of damage, the type of damage, the dates of the assessment, those types of things, all as part of an operations dashboard that allows them to make their decisions. So that's what we're talking about when we are working with integrating imagery to drive decisions. It's going from that raw source of imagery, making it easily accessible by simple applications to help drive decision makers be able to respond in a crisis or whatever the situation might demand. Now, in order to do that, it starts with a framework. And the framework for imagery inside of ArcGIS is, is identical to what we do for all geospatial information. Uh, most important is that you have a system of record, um, and that's authoritative data. And in our case, from an imagery management standpoint, that becomes your system of record. Uh, that, that high resolution, very precise, so orthorectified imagery that served as that base layer. You also need a, a system of insight. In this case, we were just visually collecting damage points and populating a, a feature service. Um, but that could also be different analytics that you might want to run against uh, the imagery, such as change detection, those types of things. And then finally, you have that system of engagement, that operations dashboard that allows you to compile the information you're collecting and start making decisions about it. So the framework is very important. 
But what makes that framework really come together is being able to access all different types of imagery. And we've seen a, a huge uh, expansion of the amount and different source of it, sources of imagery that are available right now. Um, you know, traditionally there's always been aerial photography. There's always been things like the Landsat satellite and those types of things. They've, uh, Landsat's been around for a number of years. Either, and now we've gotten into more and more higher resolution satellite imagery, uh, stuff from Planet Labs, which is now a, a daily take of imagery over the globe. Those things are very excited. Exciting, but also big changes has been the advent in the rise of drones in the past couple of years. And inside of ArcGIS, we've made sure that we have the tools now that can take advantage of these sources as well. And it's not just imagery. It can be radar, radar data, LIDAR data, of course, multispectral and hyperspectral. You want to be able to work with all those different sources to help make your decisions. And that needs to be able to be fed into a powerful imagery management solution, uh, one that can know and understand all those different sources, be able to work with all the various formats that the different content providers create, and then put that into a, an archival management system that allows simple and easy access over these global data sets. And that's really what we have focused very hard in the ArcGIS platform, is providing that rapid access to massive amounts of images. And those images can be stored on your local file systems, or they can be pushed up into the cloud and, and accessed you know, in cloud-based environments. It, it really doesn't matter if it's on-premise or in the cloud. The same tools work with both, different, both of those patterns as far as being able to access the, this, this massive amount of imagery. To make this work, it requires a powerful imagery data model. And inside of Esri, our imagery data model is known as the Mosaic data set. And the Mosaic data set is essentially uh, a feature table, but it's designed to manage and handle images. And so it has a number of capabilities that allow you to ingest, read the metadata from all the various sources, and then be able to, to publish that data as a service. So it's a very powerful tool. As you can see, it works with, with multiple different raster types, all different uh, imagery formats, and it consistently persists the metadata so you can actually go back and access the individual information. Now, it's called a mosaic data set for a reason, because what it does is it can take all these different images, like we saw over Puerto Rico, took all the, the thousands of images that covered the island, but it allows you to treat all of those images like it's just one big image. It can even seamlessly color balance those imagery to make a true virtual mosaic. So, uh, in some ways, it's like it's one big image file, but in the other, you can still get back to each individual image and, and pick up and read and manip manipulate the various metadata that goes with each one of those images. So the Mosaic data set is a very powerful tool that takes lots of images and allows you to treat them as just one big, large mosaic. The other thing the Mosaic data set allows you to do is actually build functions for those images so you can do on-the-fly processing. You can do change detection. You can do NDVI colorization, looking for healthy vegetation. You can even, even do supervised classification on the fly coming out of a, of a Mosaic data set. And we'll talk about that as we go forward. So this is what the platform looks like. Uh, you know, underneath you have the image libraries. This is coming from your server technology. That can be served up to a cloud, which is either you know, on-premise or in the actual cloud itself. From that, you can derive different products through your analytics. You can create foundation data for through orthophotogrammetry, and you can then exploit all that data through both desktop and, and, and thin-based web clients. And you can see here's the capabilities listed on the right-hand side. Imagery management, ortho mapping, image analytics, image exploitation. As we go through today's webinar, we're gonna to touch on each one of these somewhat lightly, not do a deep dive this time, but as you'll see that, and we'll talk about it at the end, this is actually a, a webinar series that we're giving. And so in the next sessions as we go through, we're gonna do a little bit deeper dive in each one of those topic areas to provide more information. As I said, one of the things that really makes this work powerfully is our, our imagery server technology. Uh, this is a separate server from the enterprise server that's part of ArcGIS. This allows you to independently scale your imagery requirements from your GIS requirements. So if you're working with lots of imagery or doing uh, massive analytics against those images, 
then you might want to scale up the amount of image servers that you have and that you can access. Another thing that the image server does is it supercharges your desktop clients. So ArcGIS Pro can actually leverage the image server as a processing engine and distribute multiple processes across multiple CPUs in a, in a way that would, you know, if you're working with very large or very complex data sets, you can do this massive parallel analysis and get results a lot quicker than if you're just running that process on a single four core CPU or whatever you might have locally. The, the two ways that that the server actually uh, serves out the images that can be used is what is known as number one is tile cache and the other one is true imagery services. Most people are familiar with tile cache. It's, it's kind of a picture of the picture. It's like the way that, that, that Google Earth actually serves out imagery. It's, it's not the actual original pixel values. It's a picture of those values that have put, been put together to create a base map. The advantages of that is very, it, it's very fast and it serves up very quickly. But the downside is you can't do any analytics against those pixel values because they're not the original pixel values of, of the original imagery. Uh, with the ArcGIS image server, we can actually serve up the original pixel values. So when you access an image service inside of ArcGIS, you can actually do on the fly analytics against that data. And as we go through the various demos today, you'll see how that works and, and how much more powerful of approach that is than just serving up straight tile cache. And as I talked about before, being able to access this data very quickly and easily is a key part of this. Even though we have that mosaic data set, which allows you to treat the images like it's one big mosaic, um, people still want to be able to go in and access the different image files that make up their libraries or their archives. And so we offer that capability as well. The Mosaic data set allows that. And you can do different queries, filters, and sorts, and, and actually just clip, zip, and ship and download that imagery directly to your local system if that's the way that you want to work with your imagery data. And as I talked about before, there's, there's two different ways that we can actually work with the imagery. We can visualize and work with the data in, through thin clients, and we'll see examples of this as we go through our, our demonstration today. And it can also be accessed by powerful desktop clients. Uh, the latest release of, of ArcGIS Pro has a number of brand new imagery capabilities that, that make the solution much more user friendly towards imagery and provide some very new and powerful processing capabilities uh, that, that make ArcGIS Pro a true image processing solution for our end users. And so speaking of ArcGIS Pro, let's jump over to our first demo. I'm gonna hand it over to, to Kyle and he's gonna go through a quick demonstration of the various uh, capabilities inside of ArcGIS Pro. All right, thanks, Kurt. <clears throat> so I'm gonna use some imagery over Rio de Janeiro, and what I'm gonna do is highlight some of the capabilities of the new image analyst extension available in ArcGIS Pro. So if we take a closer look at this image that we have over Rio, uh, you can easily tell that it's distorted. Uh, we've got mountains warped that are invading the coastline, you take a look at these buildings that are here on their side. Uh, this is because we're working with oblique imagery that's taken at a steep angle and uh, Pro is doing its best to try and match this oblique image where it should be sitting vertically on a map. But with a new capability available through Image Analyst, we can display this oblique imagery in an image coordinate system called Image Space. So I can come over here to my table of contents and list my imagery by perspective imagery. And then I can, it shows me the focusable images that are available for display and analysis in image space. So if we click on this first multispectral image, we can now view that image from the perspective of the sensor that captured that image. And when we zoom in, we can see that it's no longer distorted. The mountains are where they're supposed to be and the buildings are right side up. Uh, also, when we transfer to image space, we're given this heads up display window, which gives us easy access to the metadata associated with this image, including the uh, angle of obliquity. And this can be minimized and can be moved around the map at your convenience. Now, one of the ways that image space is useful is for editing features. So to show that, we're gonna switch over to 
the perspective of our other oblique image. And then we're going to focus on the airport in Rio. And you can see we've already started to document some of the features and we've been able to do that uh, at an angle where it's easiest to document those features. So we've been able to uh, uh, document some of the locations of the airplanes here at the airport. And we can also even document uh, the buildings around the air airport as well. And when we're done with these documentations, you can see that they transfer over to map space as well at the accurate locations. So we'll return to image space to show you one additional capability, and that is the mensuration tools that are available with Image Analyst extension. So on the imagery tab here, I can access specific tools like the simple distance, and I can calculate the width of the runway. Or I can come over here to this building and I can use a top to top of shadow height tool. And what this allows me to do is measure from the top of a building to the top of a shadow. And this will calculate the height of the building. And we can see that it's about almost 60 feet tall. Now over here in the mensuration results pane, I can come and I can edit the name of each, of each mensuration. I can give it a description and you can see that there is metadata associated with each measurement as well. I can turn on uh, multiple measurements so that they display at the same time. And I can even uh, generate text reports of these mensurations and save them to a different, lo different location. So uh, uh, that concludes working in the image space. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Kurt. Yeah, and Kyle, before you do, um, you know, I just want to point out if you haven't seen ArcGIS Pro yet, you can actually look at the up at the ribbon bar that, that Kyle has shown up there. You can see all the various new imagery tools that are part of the ArcGIS Pro environment, such as classification tools, the wizards, the raster functions, the function editors. Um, and these are all various capabilities that have that have made Pro a very powerful image processing tool. So, and we're gonna get into those a little bit as we go through, but I wanted to kind of point out those those new exploitation tools and the advantage of that of that new user interface that that makes working with imagery so much easier. So, let's go ahead and switch things over. Thanks, Kyle. That was that was a really great presentation. What's really powerful is the fact that he is is actually working with, um, you know, digital globe imagery at that high oblique and uh, able to be able to do full geospatial GIS functionality against that that very oblique data. So. I think, uh, Noel, it's time for our second poll. It looks like the polls are open. So if, if people could go to uh, the poll and take a look at, at what the various questions we have there and go ahead and answer, that'd be great. So it looks like we're getting a good mix of different users. So I was wondering where the where the drone values would were going to come in. It looks like about 12% of you have uh, actually purchased drones for your organization and have started collecting imagery. Uh, a lot of you are using some of the free satellite imagery that comes from Landsat and and ESA's Sentinel-2 imagery. Uh, and it looks like uh, some of you also purchase imagery, whether it comes from Digital Globe or or Planet. So. Those are good results. That's a good mix of, of different people that are working with imagery. So thank you for sharing that information. So let's keep going a little bit further into our presentation. And we'll actually talk about this whole uh, effort of going out and creating authoritative imagery content for your, for your GIS. And we're gonna talk about this in terms of drones, 
But what we'll see as we go through the presentation is that the software that we're developing, it works with drone information but or imagery from drones, but it also works with multiple sources as well. And we'll talk about the two different packages that we're working with to support these different uh, sources of imagery that we have. But first, let's just take a look. This is this is a couple sample projects that we've been working with with one of our partners uh, that, that does a lot of drone work. And you can see the, the massive amounts of images that they've started to work with. Uh, one of their projects was over 1,600 images. We just flew another project with them over St Fort Story, Virginia. They, they collected over 2,100 images and put that together in a very big project. But the level of detail that you can get from these drones and the, the high resolution, and not just in the 2D, but the 3D is just extremely impressive. And that, that would, that's what makes them so valuable as a, as a new information provider when it comes to imagery. And so that's why inside of, it, of ArcGIS, we've worked very hard to make sure that we can support drones. And so our first application that we put together to work with drone imagery is a product called drone to map it's a standalone application. Uh, in other words, you don't need a full ArcGIS license to, to operate and run it. It's a, it's a fairly low cost app, very competitively priced into the marketplace. And it allows you to do some very powerful things with, with imagery from drones. Uh, first off, of course, is the 2D ortho mosaics. Uh, these are essentially imagery based maps that you get. But also considered part of 2D is the elevation data. But we can also push that that, that 2D information into 3D elevation products. So you can create what's known as a photo-derived point cloud. So you, you probably have heard of point clouds through LiDAR, but with the drones, especially the high resolution imagery that you can get, you can actually also create point clouds just from drone imagery. The one disadvantage over a LiDAR point cloud is that LiDAR itself will give you multiple returns as that laser beam comes down, strikes the ground and bounces back up. So it can penetrate you know, different vegetation and those types of things with those multiple returns. Uh, with a with a photo derived point cloud, you don't have quite the same penetration. So it'll always hit on the tops of trees and, and those types of things. But the level of detail that you can get is very impressive. And you can actually push these into what's known as 3D mesh products. And so this is essentially a point cloud where the where the color of the imagery has been pasted into it. And we actually create these structural models that you can uh, work with in 3D and do you know different types of 3D intervisibility with. So it's very powerful with what we can do in 3D. And then the other thing drone to map can do is these smart inspection photos that allow you to actually just leave the picture it was taken by the drone, but go in and do different measurements and annotations, those types of things. And this would be used for like damage assessment or just evaluating a particular target that you might have interest in. So that's our drone to map application. Um, but we've also now pushed this capability into ArcGIS Pro and it's called the ortho mapping workflow. And this is a much more advanced version of drone to map. So drone to map uh, very is very focused on working with drone imagery. Um, but or the ortho mapping workflow can work with all different sources and it does very rigorous block bundle adjustment across multiple photos um, in, a, in a particular uh, a collection that was taken. And most importantly, it works with aerial and satellite imagery as well. And you can see the particular interfaces here. It allows you to collect uh, GCPs, do block bundle adjustments, and then go out and derive DEMs, ortho mosaics, those types of things. So it has a lot of the functionality of drone to map, but it's much more powerful um, as far as the different sensors that it can support. The other thing that the ortho mapping workflow can do is actually you can push the processing up into the cloud. So we actually have put together a, uh, a web-based UI for the ortho mapping workflow. You can go out and you can either collect imagery with your drones or your aerial sources, whatever it might be. And as soon as you get that data, you push it into the cloud, and then through the web-based interface, you can actually kick off the ortho processing. And this allows you to take advantage of multiple CPUs to you know, really work on those big, large projects where there's a lot of numbers that you have to crunch. And so let's take a look at the different uh, ortho mapping output product. I talked about them on probably in, you know, in enough depth before, but this just gives you an idea of the full range of different things that can be uh, that can be processed and collected either in drone to map or the ortho mapping workflow. 
We have our base mapping data. We've added the ability to do um, uh, different types of measurements as well. So we can do 3D measurements, change detection, volumetric measurements as part of the 3D processing. And of course, all this very advanced uh, site modeling and 3D modeling. Uh, and we have this new capability called the scene layer package that allows you to just with one button publish a 3D model directly into ArcGIS Online. And so you can just use a, a thin based web client to actually look at these very complex 3D models in, in, a, in a web client. So it's, it's a great way to be able to share this data uh, with, with your customers or the users of the information that you're collecting. So it's a very powerful solution that we have to create this authoritative data. The other thing we can do with the ortho mapping workflow, which we cannot do with drone to map is we can actually produce stereo products that allow you to go in using stereo glasses. And this can be simple anaglyph glasses, or you can use the advanced shutter type capabilities um, that allow you to go in and extract features very precisely in 3D in stereo, and then in turn visualize those products in 3D. So a lot of cartographic organizations insist on using stereo for collecting their features. And so now this is a new capability that is part of our GIS Pro that we're excited to be able to have. And of course, to make sure that the data is authoritative, we, we need to publish the reports that actually uh, give those people who know and understand uh, different ways of ensuring the accuracy of the data, the various reports of different block bundle adjustments and how the control points are, are, are used to actually make sure that you get the, the uh, the right accuracies of your processing capability. And it produces this complete calibration report that it lets you exactly see and understand how accurate your imagery is. Uh, so in turn, then you can use that to do your collection of information and know that the sources that you are using are truly authoritative and accurate. So I'm gonna switch it back over to Kyle and Kyle's gonna give a quick presentation on the drone to map product and just show you how simple and easy it is to be able to use this, this new source of information. So uh, go ahead, Kyle. All right, thanks, Kurt. So yeah, I'm gonna show uh, a little bit of what Kurt was talking about, in, about drone to map and some of the products that it creates. So this is, this is what the uh, opening screen of drone to map looks like when you go in and you can see you can come in here and create new projects and they and they provide templates to create uh, certain products so if you were to go and start a rapid product you could qu quickly create a ortho mosaic or elevation model based on your imagery 2d mapping template allows you to create higher resolution ortho mosaics elevation models as well as some ndvi outputs 3D mapping allows you to create some of those textured meshes and 3D point clouds that Kurt was referring to. So if we were to come here and select create a 2D mapping template, we could just give our product a name, give it to a locate, save it to a location. And then we can come here and add our drone imagery, either image by image, or I can just point it to a specific folder. And when I select the folder with my imagery, it the software immediately recognizes these images and it's also able to read the metadata and locate where those images are uh, on the earth. So for the sake of time we've already run a few projects and we can show you what the outputs of those look like but if you were to enter in those images from that folder this is this is what you would see. So it gives you the footprints of where all of these drone images uh, are taken and you can come through and view those images individually. And it also gives you the flight path of the drone itself. And so you can see that we did a nice kind of lawnmower pattern here for good overlap and improved accuracy. Uh, another thing that we did to improve the accuracy was correct collect ground control points. And what we did was on the day of the collection, we went out with a GPS receiver and collected these points. And what they do is they improve the accuracy of the products that you create. So what they do is by locating these ground control points in, in your imagery, they stitch, they stitch uh, those images to a specific uh, spot on the earth. And so you can come in here and 
look at all of the images where the ground control point is is located. Uh, you have to have it linked in at least two different images, but preferably th between three and eight images for uh, improved accuracy. So uh, once you have all of that data set, you can you can come to the processing options and customize the products that you're creating, as well as the uh, different types of uh, resolutions that you that you want. So you can select the different types of 2D and 3D products that you want to create, and then you would select start, and the software would just run for you. So we'll show you what some of these outputs look like. So we'll show you what the ortho mosaic looks like. So this was a project that we did over the Ukaipa water treatment facility in California. And if we turn on and off the ortho mosaic, you can see that the quality of the imagery from the drone is much greater, as well as much more recent. And you can see the level of accuracy of the road right there coming into the treatment facility as well. We were also able to create a couple of uh, digital terrain models as well as digital surface models. And there are a variety of tools built into drone to map that you can use to calculate distance, area, and volume of these models as well. Another, another thing that Kurt talked about was the, uh, was the processing report that uh, that you get every time you run the software. And so here it shows us where as as the uh, as the project ran, where the uh, where the software corrected the positions of the imagery to be. Uh, you can see the overlap area of where the imagery covered. And then it also gives you some other, uh, statistics as well, including accuracy. And you can see that the uh, accuracy level was about uh, three inches in the ortho mosaic. So that, that shows a 2D product that we created. I'm going to open up another project here that, uh, that shows a, three, uh, a building in 3D that we did. And you can see that the flight pattern around this building, which was a, it's a building at a community college in, in Virginia. You can see that the pattern that we, that we, uh, that the drone took around the building was more of a circular pattern, which is more recommended for, uh, for 3D features. But as we zoom in here, we can turn off the flight path. You can see the high resolution of this building in 3D, as well as some of the features around it. And you can even see uh, the level of accuracy of the cars in the parking lot, the, the high resolution. And then I'm gonna open up one more project. This is just gonna show that same building, but in 2D. And I'm gonna show that for a couple reasons to show you our how interconnected drone to map is with the rest of the platform. So I'm able to come in here and uh, open up this ortho mosaic in ArcGIS Pro by simply uh, selecting this button here. And it'll automatically start to create a pro project for me. You can also see that I have the ability to publish uh, to publish this data up to my uh, my ArcGIS Online organization as well. So we'll show this ortho mosaic. Open up an ArcGIS Pro. And we'll zoom to the layer. And we can work with this layer just like any other layer in in ArcGIS Pro now, and if you can, you can upload 3D scenes as well that that you create in Drone to Map. So with that, I will turn it back over to Kurt. Great, thanks, Kyle. That that's a powerful presentation. It's just 
it, you know, it continually amazes me on on how much we can now start doing with these very low cost drones. I was actually at that project on the community college, and and that was done with a with a Phantom Four quadcopter, and the, the results were just stunning on what you can get from a fifteen hundred dollar drone. So, anyway, we've now opened up the polls for question number three. So, if you could go ahead and take a look at the polls, and just answer our third question with regards to you know, how familiar you are with advanced image processing techniques. Excellent. Yeah, that's a that's a great mix of, of different capabilities and, and much like I suspected, um, the three percent of you that are working with advanced artificial intelligence, congratulations. It it's very exciting where where that's going and we'll see how that 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 goes forward. And you know, we're working very hard at Esri to kind of support some of those new AI techniques and I'll I'll brush on that a little bit, but we're going to have a, a webinar later in the year where we actually do more of a deep dive into the, the stuff we're doing with AI with regards to extraction of features from imagery kind of on the fly with AI tools. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about advanced uh, imagery analytics and stuff that we can do inside the, the new pro software with regards to you know, extracting features from imagery, doing change detection, those types of things. Uh, this opening slide is actually the result of an output layer from from one of our customers. Um, they actually make a product called a persistent change detection model, and essentially what they do is they, they just uh, this particular data set comes from Landsat, and they just regularly collect and do what's known as persistent change. So they want to make sure that if they see something that changes, that it is actually a real change and not something that is caused by a, a seasonal fluctuation like changes in leaves or land cover or shadows or maybe you know the plowing of a field and those types of things. So they're looking for things that persistently change and they actually have put together a global model of change um, that every year gets updated where the changes are. You can imagine how the mapping agencies like that because with that with that persistent change model, they can actually determine where they need to update their maps based on the changes that have occurred within a particular area. So change detection is a key part of what some of our customers are doing when it comes to analytics. And they're doing that with some of the more advanced image processing workflow capabilities that we have. I suspect that many of you are familiar with, with GP tools and the ability with ArcGIS to, to, to work with GP tools. We have a number of image processing GP tools that you can use to set up complex models to do things like change detection and image refusion, those types of things. Um, but maybe something you're a little bit less familiar with is, is something that we call imagery function chains or raster functions. This allows you to actually put together a similar type thing to a GP tool, but they're actually image functions that can be set to run on the fly as the image comes off the server. And so this is very powerful because you can actually set up your mosaic data set so that when you make a request for a particular area of interest, it will automatically produce a pan sharpened image for you. It'll automatically color adjust that that image or sharpen it the way you want it sharpened. It can even do things like create an NDVI or run a segmentation on top of those images. You can set those up in chains and so you're actually just doing your image processing on the fly and the result is what you visualize and see in the client that you're working with. And this screen just kind of shows you how these image processing functions can be set up and chained in a certain way and then automatically be derived on the fly. Uh, the other thing that we've added inside of Pro is more advanced classification tools. Uh, they've, they, they've, they're, they're GP tools that you can access separately, but we've also put together a classification wizard. And this is a very powerful way for those of you who are not totally familiar with, you know, the, the, very, the advanced capabilities of doing feature extraction from imagery. You can just click on this wizard and it actually will step you through the various classification techniques. And we can use both supervised classification and imagery segmentation as a classifier. Segmentation is kind of a, a new capability that has been, uh, that's come out in the last 10 years or so. And it's really about going in and instead of working with the, you know, focusing our, 
our feature extraction on the, the pixel values of each individual pixel. It segments the images into common areas, and then you work against those segments. And it's, and it's looking at more than just the pixel values. It can also be set up to use to look at the shape of the object, the shape of the segment, and those types of things. And all those become clues as to exactly what the feature is that you're looking at it. The other nice thing about segmentation is it can be set up as a fusion capability. So you don't have to just look at the individual bands of a particular image. You can actually pull in an elevation data set. You can pull in multiple different types of images, or you can do different band ratios, band combinations of the imagery that you have. Whatever you feel best can pull out the different segments inside the images that represent the things that you want to look at. So there's some very powerful feature extraction capabilities here that you can do using segmentation and building signatures. And it's all about, you know, it's still the same process of building signatures and identifying it, but you can actually just point to a segment and say, this is water, this is a shadow area, this is a building, those types of things. And then that makes your training much more simpler because uh, the segments have already been somewhat extracted for you uh, through the segmentation process. And then you just run it through a classification technique. And we offer two for segmentation. Uh, the first one is a random trees, which is a very common way of, of going through and breaking the imagery or the different segments down in a binary uh, fashion where actually, you know, it makes predictions as to exactly which tr which tree structure it classifies. Is it water or shadow? It's shadow. If it's shadow, is it this type of shadow? If it's water, is it this type of water? Those types of things. So random trees is a very powerful classification technique, but we've also added some machine learning classifiers as well, something called support vector machine. And this is where you get into classification where you have very distinct spatial dimensions to the images that you can use. So perhaps you're looking at oil tanks. And so you look at the roundness of the, the of the of the feature to actually extract out the various the oil tanks is that's something that you're looking for. So these are different tools. It's all part of the wizard and you just go step by step through the data and you're ending up with a result that comes out as a classification process. And one of the our first customers that actually helped us break in this new capability uh, was an organization called the Chesapeake Conservancy. And, you know, they're very concerned about the watershed of Chesapeake Bay. I think it's like 54,000 square miles. And before they started their project, they only had 30 meter resolution data, feature land cover feature data of the watershed. And it just wasn't enough to do the precision conservation things that they wanted to do. But of course, as a nonprofit, they don't have money to go out and buy massive amounts of you know, digital globe, high resolution, multi-spectral imagery, they needed to use stuff that was for free in high resolution, which basically left them with the, with the four band NAPE imagery that's produced by the USDA. And so using the NAPE imagery, um, they were in, in the imagery segmentation tools, they were actually able to derive a 85% accurate land cover for the watershed just using four band aerial photography. And you can see the results that they get. So they went from this covering their entire watershed to a one meter resolution. And this really allowed them to actually go in and start figuring out the areas that they could focus their precision conservation techniques again. So uh, Chesapeake Conservancy doing that work was, was a very powerful way for us to test the capabilities of their software. And through their input, we've just made the tools better and better as we've gone through it. So if you haven't played around with imagery segmentation and you're interested in feature extraction, that's an area that you might want to look. And once again, we're going to have a webinar series that, that does talk about that. As I said before, we're also working on different artificial intelligence classifiers. We, we actually took that Chesapeake Bay information, worked with the Chesapeake Conservancy and Microsoft, and have put together a, a solution trying to take that forward and actually apply those same techniques to NAEP imagery across the whole country. So that's a project that we're working with, plus some of the other customers that we're working with to do uh, different types of automated feature extraction using artificial intelligence. As I said before, we'll have a, a webinar that talks about these techniques as well. Um, and then probably I think one of the most powerful things that we've done is that we've taken all the capabilities that are part of that desktop client, that ArcGIS Pro, and where we could, we've actually made thin client widgets 
that can be plugged into a web app. And these are just example of various widgets that have been put together, but they're now all put in together as an app. And so we're gonna let Kyle kind of show how you can do advanced remote sensing processing in a thin client web app by accessing the massive amounts of the imagery that we've made available freely online to our customers. So I'm gonna turn it over to Kyle and he'll finish it up with this, this remote sensing demo uh, of multispectral imagery. All right, thanks, Kurt. <clears throat> so this is the Image Services Explorer web app and it lets us visualize and work with different types of image services all on, inside a web browser. So I, uh, I like to show this app because it incorporates a variety of the platform capabilities all working at the same time for easy imagery visualization and analysis. So this app is consuming image services multiple images deep. And it's updated nightly as new imagery comes in from, from each sensor. And the web app consumes these services in a browser. And like Kurt said, it uses those different widgets to analyze these services. So to start, one of the widgets that we can use is the renderer, which allows you to uh, select your source of imagery as well as uh, view different band combinations. So we have it set to agricultural band now for, for viewing uh, and analyzing agricultural phenomena. We can change it to a natural color band combination, view the imagery as that. We can change it to a shortwave infrared band combination uh, to highlight things like forest fires or other, other things not visible to the eye. We can even change it to a bathymetric band combination for for water features. So we're gonna turn it back to agriculture though, and then we're gonna use our search bar to easily locate imagery over Las Vegas, Nevada, and that'll zoom in there for us. And then the next, uh, the next widget that we'll take a look at here is the time selector. And so I can use this slider here to look at different images over time over the city of Las Vegas or over anywhere where I'm looking at imagery. So I can I can slide through time and look at these different images. I can also come over here to a drop down list of the imagery and select a specific image. So I want to compare this image that was uh, taken in 1991 with another image. So I'm going to select it as a secondary layer here and then I'm going to choose an image that was more recently taken in February of this year. And then what I can do now is after selecting these two images, I can select other widgets such as the swipe tool and I can compare the two images on top of each other. And we can see that there's quite a bit of uh, buildup in the past quarter century in Las Vegas. And we can see over here in Lake Mead that the water levels have gone down quite a bit as well as more people are consuming that water. So while these, two images are selected, I can also select the change detection tool to help us understand the differences between these two images. And we have it selected the change detection to detect change in vegetation index. <coughs> and so we can see that there's been, uh, we can see where growth and uh, change in vegetation has occurred. And again, pointing to Lake Mead where the water level has dropped significantly over, over the years, you can see the difference in vegetation growth uh, in those areas where there was once water. And we can adjust the transparency as well to compare uh, the change detection between the, the image itself. So next, uh, another tool that we can show here, we'll turn off the time selector. We can also show the identify tool. And this, what this is going to do is it's going to help us, uh, it can help us see uh, different spectral combinations of selected points in the area. So when we select a point here in Vegas, we can see uh, we, we selected it in what looked like a park or maybe a golf course. And we can see that the, the spectral signature of that point that we selected is most uh, 
most associated with the standard spectral signature for lush grass. So if we were to click click on a point here in uh, here in the city, it points to the spectral signature being associated with concrete. Uh, we can also look at these signatures as a scatter plot over the image that we're looking at and see where those signatures and where the majority of those signatures are. And so I can come here and draw a circle around uh, specific, uh, specific signatures and those will highlight in the image as well. So if I draw a circle around those that high concentration, it'll show me where, uh, where those signatures are located. Uh, so the last thing that I'll show, we're going to change geography a bit here. We're going to come over to Hilo, Hawaii. And I wanted to show this uh, because it really shows the usefulness of, of this app. Um, some of you may or may not have heard about this in the news, but in the last month, uh, Hawaii has experienced been dealing with heavy amounts of volcanic activity. So we can come over here to this area and we don't really see we don't really see much going on, but if we switch the image to May and then if we change the rendering from agriculture to shortwave infrared then you can easily see where that volcanic activity is standing out and occurring as uh, as, as the uh, shortwave infrared band combination really helps that type of high heat index stand out. So yeah, really neat app. Again, very powerful. Uh, it's very powerful what these widgets are able to do with these image services. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Kurt. Or uh, sorry, I'm going to end it by sending it off to Noel. Thanks, Kyle. So if any of you would like to continue your learning of these capabilities, we invite you to join your peers in GeoNet, an online community for you to ask questions, share successes, view and share story maps, and so much more. Join the imagery and remote sensing community on GeoNet by visiting go.esri.com slash join GeoNet. As you heard Kurt mention earlier, we will be hosting an entire series just focused on Esri's imagery capabilities. If you'd like to learn more and register to attend these, please visit go.esri.com slash imagery webinar series 2018. We're nearing the end of this webinar, so during this last bit, we'll answer some of the questions that you all have asked. We'll attempt to answer as many of these questions as possible, but anything we don't get to today, we will be providing answers by email. We'll go ahead and leave this slide up so you can write down those dates in that URL, and we'll get right into it. Our first question is, in mensuration mode, what image formats will this work with? So I guess I can tackle that one. Um, essentially what we're looking for is a source where we have very good metadata about the sensor. So as long as it's one of the 54 different sensor raster data types that we support, you should be able to do some very advanced mensuration against that. Um, that includes things like digital globes, all their satellites, um, the various planet satellites, Etc. Because what it does is we just need a basic sensor model and it allows us then to go in and do uh, both 2D and 3D mensuration capabilities. So we're just looking for, you know, uh, data with enough information to provide that uh, the different rotation angles that we need to be able to do 3D type measurements from raw sources of imagery. Hopefully that answered that question. Thanks, Kurt. Next question, we still have a little bit of time. So next question is, can you also make the height measurement on pan sharpened imagery? That, 
Absolutely, and we can actually pan sharpen on the fly. So if you are working, for instance, with you know Iconos imagery or QuickBird imagery, and you have both the panchromatic and uh, the multispectral data, we can actually pan sharpen that on the fly, and then you just bring that up, and we use that exact same sensor model approach to be able to do those those particular measurements. So absolutely, for sensors that we have good sensor models for, we can do it against pan sharpened imagery. Where it, where it gets a little bit tricky and just, you know, to kind of forewarn people, uh, various organizations have different image processing tools. And what they'll do is they will permanently take an image, let's say a digital globe image, and then they'll write it out as a geotiff. So they'll do some type of processing to it, and then they'll write it out as a geotiff or something like that. And they'll lose the pedigree or the metadata that goes along with those images. And that's where it gets a little bit more challenging for us because ArcGIS, we really look for that original metadata that goes along with the images. And so we can take maximum advantage of that information. So if you can at all possible, just try to maintain your imagery in its original format. And then you can do all this analytics stuff against that and take full advantage of the metadata. So, and that's something else I want to point out is when we build a mosaic data set, we're, we're not, we don't have you go in and reformat the imagery or anything. That's not what the mosaic data set does. It works with the imagery in its original format and then just provides a table with pointers back to the source pixels um, and then uses all that metadata that goes with the data. So we definitely encourage people not to go in and actually physically change the imagery from its original sources. Thank you, Kurt. And we have time for just one last question. Which met metadata do you need in drone imagery in order to get a 3D mesh product? <laughs> um, I can answer that unless, Kyle, you want to take a stab at it. So I don't, don't want to hog the questions. but. Um, Essentially, it's very good to have both X, Y, and Z. So we like, definitely need to have the X and Y of the center point of the photo, um, but we also like to have the Z elevation value, the difference of the altitude above height. And so as long as you have those three parameters, um, drone to map will actually go through and do the adjustment in the in the block bundle adjustment, the structure from motion analysis that it needs to do. Now, the way it does this is it kind of brute forces it by finding thousands of tie points in the overlap between all the images. So if you kind of have an idea of the center point of each photo and the elevation that it was taken at, it can actually just go in and find all these thousands of tie points that connect that whole image mesh together. And that's how it goes ahead and does the whole orthorectification process is it creates the elevation data from the parallax of those images and then in turn uh, does the orthorectification against that data. So right now you only just need the, the X, Y, and Z. If you get more of the parameters, if you can get the pitch yon roll, the, the aircraft in there as well, then it's even more powerful. And then we're starting to see some drones out there that, that actually have uh, real-time, excuse me, RTK imagery, which allows you to get actual very precise GP information. Uh, excuse me, GPS information for your ground control points that makes your 3D processing extremely accurate. So um, you'll get a degree of accuracy if you don't have any ground control points. You can just use the GPS on board the drone. That'll get you, you know, to a couple feet of accuracy. Um, but if you have some true ground control points that you can drop into your area, you'll get your your 3D accuracy down to the inches, depending on the source of your ground control points. So that was kind of a long answer. Hopefully it uh, hopefully it was good enough for the person asking the question. All right, well, thank you, Kurt. Thank you, Kyle, for the presentation. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We hope you have a, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Mm -hmm.